Dr. Suzuki, tell me about the event this evening. Well, it's um, primarily about the film that Ian Morrow has done. It's um, a series of interviews with Maritimers. You know, a great deal of time has been spent debating is climate change really happening, uh, how bad will it be, and all that. What we get now is the time for debating whether climate change is happening is over. What we get are people who are on the land, who are outside, fishing people, loggers, uh, people who, are, who, who see the real world, and they're telling us, look, it is happening. The oceans are illustrating it. As the oceans warm, they expand, so sea level rise. You know, you get fishermen in PEI and in, in Nova Scotia that are saying, there is no low tide anymore. There's just high tide and very high tide. And there are storm surges now that are coming up, taking out docks and, uh, and uh, the front yards of people living on the ocean. Mm -hmm. It's happening, and we better face up to it and get on with dealing with how we respond to this. What's contributing to that specifically here in Atlantic Canada? Well, I mean, climate change is happening. Globally, in the last 150 years, it's only gone up 0.8% of a degree. But uh, what scientists are saying now is we're headed well on our way towards three, four, five, six degrees rise this, this century and we've got to stop it at two degrees. So even a 0.8 of a, of a degree rise has resulted in the ocean beginning to rise through warming. We know that the Arctic is melting, uh, ice isn't forming nearly as thick and it's uh, going out much quicker. I mean it's happening. And we're contributing through the use of fossil fuels. For a province like Newfoundland, the implications of this are really severe. Because if what the scientists are saying, that in order to keep temperature from rising above two degrees in this century, it means that at the maximum we can only put out 565 gigatons of carbon. Now you don't have to know what, the, what these numbers mean, but the point is that's the fixed figure if we're going to keep from runaway climate chaos, we've got five times that amount of known reserves of oil. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? If we can only burn 565 gigatons, it means four-fifths of our known reserves have got to be left underground. The implications of that for a province like Newfoundland or Alberta are very, very severe. Is this something you think our government is considering? No. I don't think governments uh, right now politically, uh, governments are focused on economic growth and we've got to keep the money ro uh, rolling in and Newfoundland now of course is benefiting enormously from Hibernia and the other, the other wells that you've got and I think it would be very difficult for a politician to say, hey folks, we got to wonder whether we can dig all this stuff out of the ground and burn it. Right now we're, you know, we're kind of on the brink of an enormous prosperity, something that we haven't seen uh, for quite some time. Exactly. So I guess it's something, it, it's, it's all about balance. It's so ironic that here was Newfoundland so long a have-not province. And now with the oil boom, uh, Newfoundland is, is just roaring ahead. And yet at this very moment we're saying, look, humans have just been burning too much of of the fossil fuel and we simply cannot go on doing that if we're going to avoid catastrophic climate chaos. And there's the promise of more oil right now and more economic prosperity, but at what risk? What should people know about the cost of this? Well, I think that people in Newfoundland are going to have to weigh the, uh, the benefits. Are we going to essentially leave our children a world that is so hot that we simply can't uh, can't rely on, on anything where it's, you know, a hurricane like the one that hit uh, the Philippines will be very commonplace and there are enormous costs associated with that. Or are we just going to go full tilt and pull every drop of oil we can out of the ground before we then act on climate change? That's the dilemma this province is going to face. In terms of time, what are we looking at here for that two degrees? Well, a lot of my colleagues are already saying it's too late that we simply, if you look at the history of our species and how we've confronted the reality of climate change, uh, there's every reason to say that we're not going to do it. Um, but I think that we, if we care about our children and grandchildren, we have no choice. 
So for people at home who may be watching this in a practical sense, what are the things that people should be doing? You know, there are a lot of things that we can do in our own lives and it has to do with uh, getting rid of your SUV, doing a lot more walking, biking, uh, taking public transit, uh, uh, you know, uh, getting your home uh, insulated so you don't lose as much energy. There are lots of things we can do as individuals, but we need big things decided now. It's not going to be done even if 35 million Canadians all do these simple things to reduce our output, we need big decisions being made. Are we going to exploit every drop of oil that we've got? Are we going to continue to subsidize the fossil fuel industry? Are we going to continue to explore for more oil when scientists are saying we can't burn all the oil that we already know? Are we going to put a price on carbon? These things have to be done at the level of our governments. We as individuals uh, can't can't decide those things. That means that if we care, we've got to become much more active politically to make sure our politicians hear about this. Mm -hmm. And they have a responsibility, I guess, to the people who live in the community to inform them of what comes along with this economic prosperity. That's why we elect people to lead us into the next, uh, the next century. Uh, we elect them to be aware of what's going on and make decisions on our behalf. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's too much uh, uh, decision-making being made on the basis of what is in the best interest of corporation. Uh, so Exxon and, and these big fossil fuel companies, you can bet they have a huge impact on our politicians. But what about our children and grandchildren? What kind of a world are we going to leave for them? And the power of this film is these are people without any political axe to grind. They're just ordinary people that are out there fishing saying, well, I mean, things have changed. They tell us uh, that that bank used to have all kinds of bar uh, swallows in it. They're not there now. Why? Because the bank is slowly eroding. We're seeing my property. I'm losing three uh, feet a year through the ocean rising. I mean, they're ordinary people saying, look, this, this is happening. What are we going to do about it? And here, I mean, we've been having significant issues lately with coastal erosion. Of course. And that's exactly what, what is the consequence of sea level rise. When water warms, it expands. So we're already seeing the impact of that 0.8 degree rise, and it's going to get a lot worse. As the atmosphere warms up, it means that the air can hold a lot more, uh, a lot more water vapor. And that's why the atmosphere loads up with water vapor, and when it dumps, it dumps, as we saw in Toronto, when suddenly you get a flood of, that's unprecedented in Toronto, in the middle of the country, because the atmosphere is holding that much more water. And we're heating the planet up. So the atmosphere is going to load up on more and more water. That's evaporating from the oceans. And then there's the huge feedback that I'm sure Newfoundlanders know about, that with more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide is dissolving in the water, and that creates carbonic acid, it's acidifying the oceans. What will that do to a lot of the marine life that cannot tolerate that change in the acidity of the water? So we're carrying out an experiment now with the only home we have, planet Earth. And we can't allow, it seems to me, just an economic imperative to continue to do what we know is very destructive. Thank you very much. Okay.